Welcome. I'm delighted to be here with Sarah Jaffe to discuss her new book, Work Won't Love You Back, just published by Bold Type Books, which if I'm not mistaken is a offshoot of the Nation magazine that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, Sarah is a wonderful independent journalist who writes on labor and social movement issues. I've known her for a while and um, her work has been published widely. Um, she's written for newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian, as well as various other outlets, including the American Prospect. Um, she also writes regularly for our own um, journal at SLU, the New Labor Forum, and for Dissent, where she co-hosts a podcast called Cleverly Be Labored. Um, the book we're discussing today is actually her second book. I don't know how she has time to do all this writing in the top of a full-time journalist gig, but anyway, she does. The first one appeared in 2016. It's called Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. It analyzed Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, and the larger wave of protests that followed the financial crash of 2008. Um, Sarah is not only a talented and engaging writer, but her work is rooted in what, for me at least, is a very compelling political perspective that combines a deep commitment to feminism and one to progressive anti-capitalist politics. Um, I just want to start off by mentioning that for me, this is a kind of revival of a political identity that my generation um, shared back in the 1970s when I was a student we called ourselves socialist feminists and that label has returned um, in various forms in recent years, which is delightful for um, my generation. It still very much defines my own worldview all these years later and it's great to see it reincarnated um, in Sarah and her generation. Um, and as you'll hear shortly, at least the way I read it, the book is very much inflected with this kind of perspective. So. So let's start. Um, Sarah, I want to begin with a quote from the conclusion of the book, which I thought maybe you could elaborate on to just launch our conversation. You write, this is on page 425 for anyone who wants to look for it, quote, capitalist society has transformed work into love and love conversely into work. And that also is reflected in the title. Can you just unpack that for our listeners? Yeah, I have been thinking about this a lot because like the pan the way the pandemic has screwed up our entire sort of relational world as the therapist Esther Perel would say, um, has been really, 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 really at this point of a, of a year of this getting to me, I think. And yeah, so in, in writing about the various ways that work doesn't love you back. And I assume that people who are tuning in to um, this particular show hosted by these particular people, I don't need to convince you that work um, sucks, but I probably do need to do some talking about the way that like the history of how we got to this point where suddenly we're expected to love it. And I was just talking to Ruth before we started about her wonderful book, Farewell to the Factory. And the way that I think about this is like the factory workers were not expected to love their jobs. And indeed, when Ruth talked to them about leaving the factory, they did not love their jobs. And I find that book really important in the way we talk about factory work in the sort of Trump and post-Trump era, because this, this idea that factories were good in themselves still clings. But the reality of, of factory work is that you're not expected to show up and smile at it. And with the change in the shape of capitalism, we get a change in the shape of work that does require us to bring sort of more of ourselves to the workplace. It requires your emotional and intellectual engagement. And it requires basically your dreams. So now we have the dream job, which you know I supposedly have, and yet I'm exhausted all the time. <laughs> and I wanted in concluding the book to think about the ways that that also in reverse is designed to keep us isolated from each other. And I was on Twitter this morning talking about the concept of, of solidarity and the way that that was, you know, deliberately destroyed by Reagan and Thatcher and the rest of them. And that the way that this narrative of work being the thing we should love the most contributes to that progress, that process of destroying solidarity and destroying connection between people. I think that that 
is a really sort of under discussed part of the, the you know, neoliberal project, as it were that it serves to keep us isolated from each other in all of these different ways. And they are only becoming sort of more noticeable when we're literally sort of stuck in our apartments. And I've been, you know, locked down alone for the last four months. So um, I think that, yeah, the combination of those two things is actually an important hinge point of why this ideology works. It's not just that it convinces us to love our jobs, but it convinces us we shouldn't love anything but our jobs. Right. Um, you know, in reading the book, I was struck by um, a few um, visible influences on your ideas. So on the one hand, there are, um, I can see the kind of fingerprints of socialist feminist writers like Sylvie, Sylvia Federici and Selma James. Federici, um, by the way, was recently amazingly profiled in the New York Times Magazine. I never thought I'd live to see that. But anyway, this is I never thought I'd live to see somebody doing it who wasn't me. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, um, so there's there's those kind of um, back, you know, ideas in the background, definitely, and you cite them and everything. But then um, what I was more surprised to see and very delighted to see was your um, uh, embrace of the French sociologist Luc Botansky and Yves Giappello, whose book, The New Spirit of Capitalism, um, of, underappreciated in this country in my view, but very important contribution, offers an account of the way in which starting in the late 20th century, um, well, along the lines of what you said about love, work was, they argue work was reshaped in response to the social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Sorry to keep reminding you of my generation, <laughs> but anyway, and the kind of quest for meaning, not just in work, but in life that those movements expressed. And also, at the same, in the same period, the kind of discontent that um, was noted in, by many commentators at the time um, um, on the part of blue collar workers like the auto workers you mentioned before, except especially at Lordstown, a plant that recently closed, the General Motors Lordstown plant, which had that famous strike in 1973, I think it was. Um, and there was all this talk then of blue collar blues. Yes. So I just wonder if you could amplify um, or just talk a little bit more about how those different influences shaped your thinking in writing the book, both the socialist feminists, uh, Botansky and Cipello, and that whole conversation about blue collar blues. Yeah, that's a lot for one question. <laughs> it's a lot for one question. It's funny you say these ideas are in the background and I've literally got Rosa Luxemburg and Emma Goldman behind me. Um, <laughs> I have my little portraits and I'm in a sublet. This is a friend's apartment, but like the things that I bring with me um, wherever I go. Um, but the Boltansky and Chapello book, I think is great. And I think, um, I'm trying to remember actually, now that you've asked me who recommended that book to me, because I think, um, I think probably Peter, Peter Fraze, um, and also Joshua Clover, whose work I also cite in the, the sort of setup of this argument. And, um, I think also they, you know, Verso reissued it not that long ago. And so it was probably like advertised to me on other podcasts I listened to, like The Dig. But the thing that I love about that book, there are two things that I love about it. One is that it was written in, it was researched in like the 90s and came out like 20 years ago. And yet it's already sort of laying out this understanding of like the networked society way before we were all on Facebook. And it shows the way that those principles that something like Facebook operates on are already sort of embedded in the way we think about, again, work and other people and our connections. And I think this is a really fascinating thing that sort of um, flows through all of these conversations. And in fact, I, I mentioned Esther Perel in the first bit who has a wonderful podcast called How's Work, which she's a relationships therapist, but did a podcast about people's work relationships. And in it, she talks about this kind of relational capitalism. And I actually ended up writing about it for Descent using the Boltansky and Chappello framework again to talk about like the way we're all expected to be sort of constantly networking and fluid and freelance and gig work and insecure, whatever. And the argument that they make is that that is in part like capitalism sort of internalizing and synthesizing this critique that came up in the 60s and 70s by these factory workers at places like Lordstown, um, that they were basically like, once again, this work sucks. And maybe we don't wanna do it for 40 years, or maybe if we're gonna be doing it, um, I've been thinking a lot about the 
drum, the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement um, and their critique of automation, because I've been talking to Amazon workers who sound exactly sort of sometimes word for word, like the drum critiques, um, you know, that if we're going to have to do this work, maybe we should have more say in how we do it. And maybe we should have, you know, some control over the, the robots that they're bringing in to supposedly make the work easier, but actually just make the work go faster. And they, so Boltanski and Chappello do the thing that I don't like to do, which is great why I'm grateful for them for doing it, which is like read the management literature. And so they really trace the way that you can see this conversation among the bosses changing and this sort of desire to find ways to make sure your workforce feels intrinsically motivated to work and not just for the money. Um, and the last thing on that last night is um, my friend Connor Lewis, who's one of the people behind the Strike Wave newsletter, um, showed me Building Trades TikTok last night. And the thing that is wonderful about Building Trades TikTok is this great sort of irreverent, jokey, like, yeah, why would you want to be an iron worker? Because apprentice wage is $23 an hour and journeyman wage is like 40 something dollars an hour. It's like, they're very clear that this is about the money. And I, I found that like so refreshing considering, again, the way we're supposed to talk about work now is we're supposed to sort of be embarrassed to talk about the fact that, you know, there should be money. And that brings me back to the socialist feminist argument and particularly the wages for housework argument because wages for housework um, blew up everybody's perceptions and, and sort of made so many people mad even within the feminist movement, even within socialist feminists, right? by saying that housework is work and maybe we should get paid for it if it's work. And there was always a tension within wages for housework, whether they really wanted wages or they just wanted to be able to say no to the work. But either way, you know, pointing out that we work for the money has in all of these places kind of radical potential to just be like, yo, this is work. And we do it like Selma James says, because we and our children would starve if we didn't. Yeah, the new stimulus package that is being mm. voted on this week actually includes a form of what you might call wages for housework yes. in the U.S. catching up over half a century after Europe and offering child allowances, at least for the duration. So we'll see. But that's something <laughs> something new here. And I US. want everybody involved in everybody who voted for that and also voted for Bill Clinton's <laughs> welfare reform owes an apology <laughs> to the women of the welfare rights movement. There you go. Well, it's good that they voted for it. It's great. But like, how long did we spend demonizing welfare queens? And then now we're like, oh, maybe, maybe parenting is actually really hard now that people have been sort of stuck doing it 24 seven <laughs> pandemic and like, oh crap, maybe we should recognize that work. Well, yeah. and also, it's, you it's, know it's who not... said that? Johnny <laughs> Tillman said that, <laughs> like, you know? It probably helps this time around that it's not just poor women who are um, mm -hmm. in this situation as we've seen in the pandemic. But anyway, yeah. all right. Well, this is actually a great segue to what I wanted to ask you next. Um, the book begins rather unconventionally for a book on quote unquote work um, with the unpaid work of women in the household. Um, and then you move from there to explore paid domestic labor, you know, housekeepers, nannies, et cetera, home care workers. Um, one thing that struck me in your discussion of paid domestic work, again, in contrast to much of the literature on the topic, at least in sociology, my discipline, yeah. where it's kind of defined as this unique occupation where exploitation is uniquely intense and um, you know, women are the employers, so there's a sort of moral invective against the employers that doesn't um, seem to... Um, happen when people are writing about ordinary other forms of work where the employers are male. Um, anyway, you, in contrast to that literature, don't define this as a unique occupation, but as rather as one with um, a lot of shared characteristics with other kinds of low wage employment. So um, I, I would love to hear you elaborate on that. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about an interview I did with A. Jen Poo of the National Domestic Workers Alliance back in 2012, where she said like, look, the gig economy isn't new. The gig economy is just more and more workers getting the conditions of domestic workers. Um, and that, you know, thinking of it that way and understanding that like there have always been workers who are carved out of 
labor law in this country, right? And they have been traditionally, they have been black workers, they have been women workers, they have been immigrant workers. And that, you know, that carve out is based in racism and sexism. And it will always sort of tend to grow. So whatever, whichever workers we sort of create like special cases for being the most exploitable, capital is gonna go there. Whether they literally pack up, close the factory down in Indiana and move it to Mexico or Bangladesh or wherever, or whether they just find more ways to grow those carve out because like capital is gonna seek the lowest labor cost because this is how capitalism works. Um, and that is true and, and sort of also ends up being true if you are an employer of a domestic worker who is also going to, you know, probably end up seeking the lowest labor costs. So all of this has like much more in common than we often wanna think. And like Ruth and I were just talking the other day because I'm doing a story on worker centers and we're talking particularly about the way that like a lot of organized labor didn't understand immigrant workers for a long time and sort of were, you know, had this idea that they were the problem rather than the problem being having accepted for however many decades, centuries, labor law that writes certain people out of it, not based on anything about the work, but based on who those workers are. And this is like it's absolutely true of women's work writ large. And this is why teachers right now are just getting the crap beaten out of them in, you know, not just the mainstream newspapers, but even in magazines like The Nation. People have written things like scolding teachers needing to get back to, to the classroom. It's really frustrating, frankly, um, <laughs> because I've been pitching articles going like, no, this is wrong and getting crickets um, because we expect women to do their work, not for the money, but for love. And if they love the work, then therefore they should be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes. And that means increasingly long hours. It means buying your kids food and clothing out of your own pocket. It means working in crumbling school buildings without toilet paper and soap in the bathrooms. And now it requires literally going to get coronavirus and die. And we just somehow think that that's okay. And then also that these teachers can like solve the problems of a pandemic by going back to the classroom when in fact, if they go back to the classroom without any sort of safety precautions, what they're going to do is make the pandemic worse. And then probably also get blamed for that because we love to blame teachers for everything because we love to blame women for everything. Um, so yeah, so I, I would say you can't talk about work without talking about gender and race rather than the people who would like to say, if you talk about gender and race when you're talking about work, you're talking, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, before I go on with the rest of the questions I have, I want to invite all the people listening on the webinar to insert, a couple of you have already done this, to put some questions in the Q&A box for Sarah so we can include those in the conversation. So please um, do that if you have thoughts on what she said so far or if you've actually read the book. Um, or want to know more about some piece of it, uh, go ahead and, and put your questions there. Um, so speaking of teachers, um, you point out, you have a whole chapter on teachers in the book, mm -hmm. and you note there that um, historically teaching was socially constructed as a kind of extension of, of mothering, of women's caring work in the home, um, which of course helps account for why it's a very underpaid profession, um, since it's still female dominated, although well, not as much as in the past. Um, but you also discuss in the book the ways in which teachers have emerged recently, especially in 2018, on the leading edge of um, labor militancy in the United States. And I wonder if you could discuss to what extent their organizing also reflects the um, narrative of care that yeah. characterizes the work culture of teachers. Yeah, the fun thing about doing that chapter was like, I'd already written about teachers in, in my first book. I wrote about the Chicago teacher strike there. And in this one, I really went sort of deep down the rabbit hole of just books on the histories of teachers unions and found that so many times sort of over again, this, this 
type of organizing would occur and then sort of get pushed down or squashed. And that there's always been this tension between sort of social movement unionism and professionalism within teachers unions. And that, so you would look back at, at the beginnings of what became the Chicago Teachers Union a hundred and some odd years ago, where you had women teachers who were organizing with their community because they didn't have anything called collective bargaining rights. Um, they were doing things like researching who in the city didn't pay their taxes so that they could find more money for the schools. And they were, you know, aligning themselves with the labor movement, but also with like other women workers specifically. And then that sort of gets squashed because when you form the National American Federation of Teachers, a man clearly needs to be in charge of it because, you know, it's 19 whatever and men are in charge, even though, you know, brilliant organizers like Margaret Haley sort of get written out of the story. And then again, in the history of like New York's teachers union, which was the communist led teachers union, again, you find teachers organizing in the community with black and brown parents writing culturally relevant curricula. Hi, before we called it ethnic studies, they were doing it. And that when they were getting, you know, blacklisted and red baited out of the classroom, those parents fought for them. What does that sound like? It sounds like Chicago in 2012, right? Um, it sounds like all of this. And so, you know, this is this tradition that that continues and then it gets sort of squashed down by the collective bargaining model. And then you have fun things like Ocean Hill Brown's bill, which I can elaborate on if anybody really wants to go to that depressing moment. Um, but, you know, you again, you get this sort of professional narrative of teachers getting pitted against, in that case, black and brown parents who are saying, do you care about our students? And so when teachers unions have been successful, it has been because they have demonstrated that kind of care for the parents and the students, and then brought that, you know, into a sort of reciprocal relationship, right? I was tweeting this morning about solidarity having to be a relationship. It's not just a one-sided thing. So if you are working in solidarity with the parents, that means that they also show up for you. And we're seeing that because despite all of these stupid articles blaming teachers for everything right now, polls show that parents, particularly black and brown parents, are still siding with the teachers and do not want their kids pushed back into school until it's actually safe. So, you know, whatever you write in the New York Times, unless, you know, somebody writes something good about it in the New York Times, um, the parents who actually feel some solidarity from their teachers are, you know, willing to extend that back. And that kind of relationship has really worked to subvert this, you know, top down ed reform narrative that teachers just don't care and they're lazy and they're taking advantage of whatever. And they are basically, you know, the modern welfare queen, because once again, if we leave the welfare queen story out of anything, we miss everything. Um, and of course, that the kind of uh, slogan that came out of the Chicago Teachers Union and, and the strikes in 2018 as well was this idea of quote, bargaining for the common good, which has now been, um, well, some people, organizers are trying to extend into other arenas. So yeah. um, it reflects exactly what you were talking about, these alliances between parents, the so-called customers of the schools, right. as some, some people use that language, right. um, and the teachers' interests as workers. Um, of course, in the pandemic, that's fallen apart to some extent with the conflicts that you mentioned before over how um, many parents are impatient with the teachers' efforts to protect but Not themselves. as many as the, the, compared to the media narrative, it's not nearly as many. Um, and there's one poll that actually found something like 55% of parents would even support teachers striking to ensure safe conditions. Mm -hmm. So like, again, parents are actually on the teacher side despite this sort of high level narrative by mostly white, mostly secure, middle-class parents who probably live in the suburbs and or send their kids to private school, um, just, yeah. you know, who have no idea of the reality of like, when the Los Angeles teachers went on strike in 2019, they were fighting to get class size down from 45 in some cases. 45 high school students in a classroom that as, you know, many of them noted to me was built a hundred years ago, not for 45 students. Right. Yeah, well, that was an issue way before the pandemic, actually. Yeah, but yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. This is this is what they've been, you know, fighting for in, in New York public schools in you know, Chicago public schools is like, can we have less overcrowded classrooms, please? Yeah. Um, so there's a question in the chat that I want to share. I mean, in the Q&A, sorry, that um, right. from 
the historian Nelson Lichtenstein, who's here with Hello, us Nelson. on this um, podcast, and he writes, um, how do, how do man modern management efforts to inject love into work per your book title differ from um, the human relations school of management? I don't know if you're familiar with this, Sarah, but like Harry Braverman wrote about it, for example, mm -hmm. of Elton Mayo and the um, the Hawthorne experiments at Western Electric, you know, for those who don't know, those were these experiments that showed that if you paid attention to workers, basically their productivity went up. So all you had to do was like make the lights brighter or ask them, quite, you know, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So is that a precursor of what you're writing about or is it qualitatively yeah. different or what? Yeah, no, I think it's it's an evolution of this process, right? And I, again, I didn't sort of study the management literature in the same way. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of um, making you know, inferences here from, from the work that I did do. But the way that this has sort of been like a growing and growing and growing um, process of, of convincing us that we love our jobs, right? Um, that is absolutely rooted in these, these old, old studies of sort of what workers want. And like, I'm also thinking of like the, the shift to the, um, Oh my God, I'm blanking on the whatever, but like in the shift to sort of lean management, um, lean production models, the sort of shift to teams, right? And the way that like, again, if we sort of find ways to, to sort of create fake solidarities, essentially uh, management assigned solidarities, then we can cut down on, you know, people's desire to unionize. Um, so I think that all of that plays a role in it. And I think it's really, really fascinating to sort of look at the, the ways in which, um, those narratives have sort of changed over time as, you know, as production goes down. But then, you know, when I was researching a piece on nurses that isn't in this book, but it was came out at the nation um, at about the same time, we were talking about lean healthcare and the same way that they, you know, that hospitals have imported that kind of management techniques from, you know, Japanese auto production into the hospital. And what that did in the pandemic was like, it was built around having no slack in the system, which means that suddenly when you have a massive healthcare crisis and you have thousands more sick people than you're used to, you're storing bodies in, in refrigerator trucks because we just, there's absolutely no sort of non-productive time, which is something that Judy Sheridan Gonzalez from, from Nisna, you know, I remember saying this to me when we did an interview, God, it was around Occupy Sandy. And she was like, yeah, like the hospitals hate NPT. They call it non-productive time. And I was like, what is productive in a hospital? What are we producing, right? Um, but that, the way that that, the sort of the language and the management styles of production get moved into um, caring and service labor at the same time as the production itself is sort of disappearing and the caring and service labor is actually a much, much bigger part of the economy. I think all of that is really um, important to, all, to a step. And also yeah. anybody who hasn't read Nelson Lichtenstein's books on particularly Walmart, I've been citing your book on Walmart all the time. So thank you for being here. <laughs> and Nelson also has a sort of footnote to his question, which is that in, uh, in Clark Kerr, the um, industrial relations guru of uh, the post-World War II years, wrote in a in a 1950s essay he called Elton Mayo a fascist so that's an interesting uh, footnote <laughs> yeah. here. yeah um, look, go figure um you know you don't actually talk about hospital workers in the book you cover many many yeah. other occupations but um it's striking that even before the pandemic one of the um one of the bright spots in the labor firmament as we all know it's uh, there aren't a lot of those but it has been nurses unions yeah. which have um expanded and you know been quite um, Milton, partly in response to um, what you just described. So that's another, besides teachers, that's another, it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting that these so-called semi-professions that are historically mm -hmm. and today female dominated have become, yeah. uh, you know, the centers of women's um, organizing and very different from the traditional labor movement, um, which, you know, at least the iconography is all about blue collar male workers. Yeah. Here we have college educated women sort of leading the charge. And I think not entirely absent from that. I, don't, I wonder what you think about this is the um, the gender hierarchies within, mm -hmm. especially medicine where nurses yeah. do 99% of the work and doctors get 99% of the credit kind of thing. And yep. you know that whole dynamic combined with the application of industrial management style 
uh, lean production or whatever to hospitals, you know, is an explosive combination. That's yeah. my own view of it anyway. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And like, I, the reason there isn't a nurses chapter in the book is we sort of were like, okay, which one, because it, it if I had had a chapter for every kind of work that I wanted to include, the book would be 800 pages long and my editor sure. would have killed me. Um, so we had a negotiating process of this. Of like, okay, the story that I would tell about nurses is in important ways different from, but also very similar to the story about teachers. And at that moment, I was getting on a plane to fly to Los Angeles to cover the LA teacher strike. And so it was like, okay, we're going with this because it's what's blowing up right now as I'm writing the book. But the reason that I wanted to do the story for the nation on nurses um, at this moment was to just be like, this is a thing that, that, you know, belongs in this book. And that piece is sort of a slightly shortened version of a book chapter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and because right, they, they are both this gendered labor that is educated, but is also sort of always denigrated because we don't like take their education quite as seriously um, in part because it's specialized, right? Like when, when, you know, nursing schools, um, teachers, you know, where the, the, the way that like some teachers went through specific teacher specific programs rather than like, you know, went to Yale and did teach for America, which is a whole other thing. Um, and in part, just because they're women and we just don't take women's intellectual labor seriously. Um, when I was working on the piece for the nation, I talked to Suzanne Gordon, who's done written a million books about healthcare. And um, we actually met because I was reporting on the VA. And then I was like, oh, but you've also written about nurses. Let's talk about your, your nurse work. And she was like, you know, everybody talks about nursing like it's heart work, but it's actually really difficult and complicated brain work. And it doesn't get discussed as such. It gets discussed as if you just sort of go in and hold the patient's hand and like not to discount the caring part of nursing, which is really, really important, but also it's diagnostic work. It's um, you know, it's treatment work. It's it's making all of these decisions because actually you don't see your doctor for most of the day, especially in American healthcare. I've been spending a bunch of time in the UK lately. So like the differences between the NHS system and our completely screwed up system are really interesting um, because the doctors aren't so individualized there, right? Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, the fact that nurses have been, um, you know, National Nurses United, California Nurses Association have been the face of the fight for single payer healthcare in this country for the last however long it's been my entire time reporting on it, right? Nurses have been advocating for it and that they have been out in front on sort of progressive policy um, all, and endorsing Bernie Sanders and things like that and sort of pushing the labor movement on these issues that often, you know, again, some of the labor movement doesn't want single payer healthcare because they're invested in the, you know, collectively bargained healthcare plans that they have, which are dying out. Um, so it's been fascinating to watch that push. And also, you know, again, the tensions within organized labor where like people don't necessarily want to yield to the leadership of these, you know, 75 or 76% of teachers are still women and 90 or 91% of nurses are still women. So that's, that's the numbers we're talking about, right? Right. Well, um, there's a question in the chat that kind of, I'm gonna combine with one of the questions I was gonna ask you anyway. Um, Jason Russell asks, was Arlie Russell Hoekschild's The Managed Heart on your mind when you wrote your book and you do yes. cite Hoekschild. And um, I, I think it's particularly relevant to the chapter. Oh, well, it's relevant throughout maybe, but um, Hochschild is the one who first uh, sort of laid out the idea of emotional labor, which has now entered the kind of popular lexicon, but yeah. that book is the kind of origin of it. And yeah. um, in your chapter on retail, yeah. say, retail is now the, the largest sector, what well, depends how you count, but in right. the United States and yeah. in terms of employment, and again, it's female dominated, underpaid. and the brick and mortar version of it, which of course is under attack yeah. in various ways right now, does involve a lot of emotional labor. Could you just talk about that maybe in connection to with the influence of Hoekschild? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, emotional labor, which is like the most annoying thing to find on the internet because like everybody just basically uses the term now to mean like having feelings about labor. Um, and I'm just, I will die on this hill of like, no words mean things. Um, there's actually a really great meme that went around the other day that was about this sort of thing. And I can't describe a meme because it's just going to kill it, but I'll, maybe I'll put it in the chat link. Um, the way that I think of emotional labor and to sort of differentiate it is that it's about managing your feelings to produce a feeling in someone else. So it's about production. It's just about production of an emotional state that 
we have a really hard time putting a number value on. So the fact that like those feelings do create surplus value is like, I, I would assume not, you know, arguable, but it's really hard to say how much, right? That Walmart greeter that Walmart pays to sit there and just like wave and say hello to you when you walk in the door. Um, I mean, I bet Walmart probably, Nelson can probably answer this question, has a line item somewhere for exactly how much that is worth to them. But like they, um, they find that valuable enough to pay somebody what little Walmart pays anybody to do that. And any, but there's actually a really wonderful article that I've been citing a lot um, by Polly Smith at Tribune magazine talking about being a retail worker during the pandemic and the extra load of emotional labor when you are the only person that some customer has maybe seen all week. And so, you know, she was writing about like elderly people coming into the store where she worked and just wanting to chat because they're alone and they're not trying not to go out very much because of course, like the risk of getting COVID. And so, you know, suddenly you have like, not only the burden of like, you have to smile and, and be nice to people no matter what they say to you, but then you're also like very, very aware that you might be the only human this person has interacted with um, all week in a couple of weeks. Um, this is something I've heard from several retail workers, pharmacy workers, grocery workers during the pandemic is like that extra sort of people really need us right now in a way that, you know, this whole essential worker framework um, is, you know, it gets at but doesn't get at that particular component of like what it takes to you to control your feelings, to smile. I was joking yesterday that I've been on so many Zoom calls that like my face muscles actually hurt from smiling. Um, and it reminded me of when I used to wait tables because <laughs> my face muscles would often hurt from smiling. And the way that it gets flattened, I find um, frustrating because it, it ends up doing that thing that we talked about in the first question that Ruth asked where, where we turn love into work. So like the way that people are like Venmo me for answering your question is like, that's not what, that's not good. We don't want to like go into a world of microtransactions for every like caring interaction we have. That's not a good thing. Um, it's not, it's not like the solution to this problem, right? whatever the problem is, is it social media? Is that like Facebook is work? Um, we can talk about that if we want to. Um, we talk about, you know, clicking like on Facebook is a micro labor transaction. Don't at me. Um, but we don't want everything to be understood as labor actually. Like what I really, really want at the end of the day is, is to claim more time away from work by being clear about what is work. And so, you know, you, you are not under any obligation to be friends with everybody, but like making every emotional interaction into a transaction doesn't seem like a great way to claim space away from work and, and potentially think about, you know, liberating space from capitalism. So one of the things I remember from the Hoekschild book, which was published ages ago, maybe yeah. in the 90s, I forget exactly when, but um, her examples are um, flight attendants mm -hmm. and bill collectors. And deliberately, she mm -hmm. picks a female-dominated and a male-dominated occupation, yeah. both of which exploit emotional labor. Yeah. Um, there's this wonderful story of a flight attendant who is um, doing her job in an airplane when a male customer says to her, honey, why aren't you smiling? You know, something that women hear all the time in all sorts of settings. And she says, sir would you smile at me for a minute and so he does and then she says now hold it for 18 hours <laughs> so that yeah. kind of sums up the book to me yeah but, but the fact that it, it's all remembered for that book is mostly remembered for the um analysis of flight attendants mm -hmm. labor but there is this other case in there about bill collectors and it for me it raises another question which is so far we've talked entirely about female dominated occupations in this conversation and the book is dominated by that too for reasons you've already mentioned but what about male workers are they also expected to love their jobs in the same way you know, could you just talk yeah. about that side of it a little bit yeah so i mean the second half of the book is about sort of creative work i'm wearing my william morris print um blazer as a shout out to that section and um to eileen boris i don't know if she came to this call but i figured just in case i would wear the william morris blazer um because eileen boris's wonderful book on art and labor was one of the things that helped me figure out how to write that section of the book 
And the way that like the creative worker is sort of gendered masculine, right? That the genius is actually a term that like means something like male spirit of a family originally, which I think is hilarious. So the way that like tech workers now is sort of this, this um, maybe the ideal type male worker of 2021 is like the computer programmer. Um, although that is also work that started out being women's work. And then when men realized it was going to become prestigious work, they sort of took it over and, and like changed the narrative about it, like very deliberately in ways that are really fun to read about. Frustrating, but fun to read about. And I always think of, of something that Bethany Morton wrote on this front that like the real narrative is not that like we of the last, you know, few decades is not that we all get to be doing like high powered knowledge work, but actually that like men get to be feminized clerks. So like the spread of feminized work means that we all get put in that feminized service position more often than not. Um, and then on the flip side of that, if you're in the sort of tech job, which, you know, for now maintains some level of prestige, although like they're working very hard on destroying that. So like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg isn't investing in immigration reform advocacy because he's nice and wants to have more immigrants because he's a nice person. It's because he wants to drive down the wages for the people that he employs. Um, so, you know, there is there is an all of the learn to code, learn to code coding boot camps are not done out of the goodness of anyone's heart. They're done to try to drive down wages for coding so that it is no longer a prestigious occupation, but that it's actually just another blue collar field. So that said, you know, the, the sort of story in a lot of these tech workplaces, and I profile video game programmers for that chapter, is that you're, the workplace is sort of designed around doing everything for you that you might otherwise do at home. So they'll feed you and there's maybe nap pods and um, <laughs> massage and you can, you know, go to a doctor on the Google campus or whatever. And like, those are all des designed to sort of keep you at work forever and make you more invested and your work is really cool. And so you never go home. So, you know, some of these games programmers that I talked to were like, yeah, there are like stretches of my life where I just like went to work, stayed at work till like 10 o'clock at night, ate dinner at work because they would order you take out if you stayed past seven o'clock or whatever, and then go home, go to sleep, wake up in the morning and go back to work. And um, the way I ended up thinking about it was that, you know, the, the tech workplace basically wants to be your wife so that you don't actually do anything like have a wife outside of work. Um, you do have a chapter on working for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, the phrase I remember for that is suffer for the cause. And it kind of dovetails with one of the questions in the um, Q&A box, which is from someone called Dahlia Goldenberg, who asks, What's it's sort of this isn't just about the work of it, but you'll see what solutions do you envision for leaders of community organizing groups that have a radical mission but get stuck in the capitalist trap exploiting community organizers, particularly um, women of color. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge problem. Um, in the nonprofit chapter, I, I profile a worker who was at a Planned Parenthood in the Rocky Mountains and was part of the union drive there. And they, you know, were very disappointed when Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains union busted them. And this is is not, unfortunately, an uncommon thing to hear in otherwise progressive organizations and progressive media. Hi, I have lived through this, um, where you are told essentially that you know you're hurting the cause if you make any demands for yourself in a way that is not dissimilar to the way that teachers are told that they're hurting the cause if they make any demands for themselves. Um, if you're in a community organization and you are saying, I need a raise because I can't afford to live in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, you know, Atlanta, whatever, on what you're paying me, then you are told essentially that you are taking money out of the you know programs for your constituents, your members. And the problem with that is like, if we follow that to its actual conclusion, right? And you don't have decent pay at these institutions, then what you end up with is kind of a Teach for America model where you get people who come from money, who do it for a couple of years until they're burned out and move on, and then you just replace them. Rather than having community organizations that can actually be staffed by 
the communities that they come from who, you know, if they, if people went to college from working class communities, they're going to be carrying more debt. They are going to maybe have family members that they're supporting. They're going to come in with all of these other needs that are different from somebody who went to college, had it paid for, and is now sort of doing their charity work. And this framework of, of charity is sort of ends up being inevitably unequal. And you know we're stuck with existing under capitalism. So of course the the real solution to all of this is destroy the capitalist mode of production. But within it, you know, I, I unionize your community org. Like seriously, give the workers who are doing the work a say in what gets done. And if you're worried about that being harmful to your members, then hire your staff from your membership. And that way you're continuing to listen to the people that you serve when they are also your employees. And of course, what happened, you know, after the sort of first big round of Black Lives Matter protests in places like Ferguson is that the big foundations tossed some money at these organizations, many of which had existed, like the Organization for Black Struggle had been around for like 25 years or something. And this was the first time they had money to hire paid staffers. But then, you know, too often the foundations change their minds, get bored, move on to the next thing. And the, you know, young black protesters who got hired by these organizations for the first time then lose their job. And then, you know, then we have another upwell of Black Lives Matter. And then again, everybody's like, oh wait, black people, we should pay attention to that. And it just annoys the ever loving hell out of me, frankly. <laughs> so, you know, this is a, it's a problem that, that, you know, funders in part create but we don't solve it by expecting people to endlessly do more with less. Um, I was struck by the way you structured the book, which I thought was very clever. So the chapters have a kind of uniform structure where you start with a story of one individual, which kind of, I think, at least for me, hooks the reader very effectively into your, you know, into that case. And then you, kind of step back and look at the history of whatever kind of work it is and working up to the present and the current issues. And each chapter ends with an account of organizing in that field. Um, and I think that our audience is especially interested in the last bit, the organizing um, among these various groups of workers. And um, one of the, uh, Marjorie Harrison in the chat asks, what recommendations would you have for how labor activists can bring these understandings, that is the understandings of your, that you give us in the book, into their day-to-day -day union workplace political work, especially, she says, the need to highlight excessive individualism. Mm. Which is just one <laughs> part of it. But, more, but maybe you could talk about that as well as the yeah. broader um, organizing lessons that yeah, yeah. So the framework of the book was actually suggested um, by my wonderful editor, Katie O'Donnell. Um, she was like, focus on one person and really bring it in. And it was, it's a struggle for me because uh, that very excessive individualism, right, makes me sort of rebel a little bit against telling sort of one worker's story. But it is, I think, effective emotionally to get people to say like, okay, this is this person and this is what their work looks like. And here are the ways that I can relate to that work by the sort of um, deep dive that, that the book takes into that kind of work. So that even if you do not do one of the 10 types of work that are, are profiled in the book, you can hopefully see the resonances with your own work. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I am not an organizer. <laughs> so I always feel bad when I'm like on a call where there are probably, you know, if there are 113 participants on the Zoom, probably most of you can give better organizing advice than me. But the thing that I would say about this sort of um, excessive individualism and the story I get to go back to working on today after we get off this call is about um, a union in the podcasting world. And they are talking about the way that like, you end up feeling competitive for raises and things like that. And so the union is actually a way to sort of not have to compete in that way. And also um, they, like so many of the workers that I talked to, which is why I wrote this book, do say like, we love our job and we love working here and we wanna make it better. And if we can think about that as not a thing that you have to like beat out of people that you're organizing with, but actually say, okay, 
how do we, how does that actually become like a strategic part of this campaign? So the way that the Chicago teachers um, and you know, y'all miss Karen Lewis, um, the way that the Chicago teachers said, you know, our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. How do, how do we sort of use that when organizing in all of these different ways and different frameworks? So how is it useful to media workers to say, we love our jobs and we wanna make them better and more equitable and more diverse? How do art museum workers who have been organizing like crazy lately, um, you know, who also love what they do and the institution that they work for often and also still wanna make it better? Uh, I think there are, are a lot of ways that this can actually be usefully turned against the company, shall we say, um, in, you know, this, this, I mean, sometimes it's just such obvious bullshit, like at Amazon, where they're like, the workers love Prime Day, it's great to work twice as hard as usual. Um, that's obviously crap, right? But like, when you're, you know, organizing in media or the arts or caring work, um, it can be a lot more true that we do love our work. So how to not sort of get caught in that trap that like, therefore I love my work, therefore it is the most important thing for me to be individually successful. Um, and I mean, I'm literally sitting here having written a book and being a freelancer, but to think about the way forward in all of this is not something we can do individually. And like when this first, first came out, um, when the book first launched in January, which was a while ago, um, people were asking me a lot, like, what individual advice do you have for people? And I was like, join a union. And they were like, but individually. And I was like, no, no, no. The point is that you can't solve it individually. Um, and that was really hard for some people to hear and probably not at all on this call, which is great. Because yeah, sort of the entire point of talking about this is like a historical phenomenon and as one that is, you know, true over a wide variety of types of work is to say that like it is very much not an individual problem, but it is a very, very much like common problem that we have to surmount in order to think about how to change the way we work and the way we live and get some time back away from that work. Well, and the way we organize. You know, what you just were talking about sort of reminds me of um, some people will know the name Chris Rondeau, who long ago started a union among clerical workers at Harvard University. And one of her slogans was, it's not anti-Harvard to be pro-union. So she pioneered this kind of, um, many people would call it a sort of feminist form of union organizing yeah. in which um, the kind of adversarial tradition in which, you know, hate the bosses, fight for the workers um, that you know we inherited from the labor movement for many years and it wasn't always inappropriate, I should say. Yeah. Um, she sort of transformed that into something more along the lines of what you're describing. And, and, and I think there is a feminist moment. There are certainly, um, you know, it, it relates to jobs where um, the point is not that you hate the bo boss. The point is that you want to be able to do your work properly without interference and so on. Um, it's also striking to me that so many of the cases you talk about where the organizing and, and I, you know, where organizing is actively underway, um, for example, nonprofits, for example, we haven't discussed this today, but um, you have a whole chapter on academics and of course, adjunct faculty organizing is another place where there's a lot going on right now. Um, you don't, this isn't in the book, but as you know, journalists are also organizing very vigorously at the moment, both with the News Guild and the Writers Union. So um, what's striking to me is that all of those things are led by highly educated young people um, who maybe are at the cutting edge of some of what you're describing in the book. Um, we, we are almost out of time, but maybe you could say a little bit about why, why are those groups in, you know, in a sea of sort of disaster for organized labor in recent years, we see these islands of very vibrant activity and in, in sectors like that. What's behind that? How can we understand that in given the framework you develop in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's happening is the thing that that Paul Mason famously called the graduates with no future, right? As your 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 upward mobility is just not there the way you thought it was. I mean, I'm speaking as somebody who finished undergraduate in 2002. 
That was great. Finished grad school in 2009, even better. Um, and now here I am trying to sell a book in a pandemic. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's both like incredibly frustrating to me. I'm 40 years old. I would like to have some security in my life before I die. And also like, it's been incredibly helpful to me in some way to understand that like the problem is not me. The problem is like timing and the collapse of global capitalism. And so, you know, what we're understanding is, is that just because you love your work doesn't make it not work and doesn't make it not alienated labor that still exploits you. And, you know, if I could sum up the point of that, I want people to take away from this book in one sentence, it would be that. And so young people going along with an interest in socialism, anti-capitalism, right? I mean, Ruth, your research on Occupy up till now, you know, young people who support Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, um, whatever comes after them. And now we have the squad, which we have like the face of that generation, which I think is so fascinating because we've got immigrant women, we've got um, all women of color. Now there's Jamal Bowman, so there's a man now. Um, but, you know, you've got, and other than um, Rashida Tlaib, whose dad was a Detroit auto worker, um, they are all sort of more or less like the new working class, right? Like Ilhan Omar represents a lot of Somali immigrant and refugee workers, many of whom work at an Amazon facility and were some of the first people to get Amazon to the bargaining table to talk about prayer time and respect for their fasting during Ramadan. And this is just, this is the face of the left now. And it's, it's more complicated than, you know, some people would like it to be, but it's come back to a recognition that like class didn't actually disappear with the end of the Soviet Union. <laughs> and and um, that, you know, the end of history wasn't the end of anything. And, well, it was the end of something, but, um, and that we still have to have these struggles, but the way we have them in 2021 is not going to look like they did in 1917, no matter how many people stand up at left forum and talk about it, um, that we're going to have to figure out how to organize in the world we have. So, you know, in my latest um, under the radar column, which will be in the next new labor forum, I write about um, the three unions of workers at Spotify streaming a work stoppage during a pandemic on Twitch. So they go on this platform <laughs> that is mostly known for people watching other people play video games and they live stream to strike. And like, okay, so this is how we organize now when you are workers in digital media where you're, you know, your audience is online all day. So how do we get their attention? Well, being on the picket line outside of the headquarters in Brooklyn is actually not going to get nearly as many eyeballs as being on the internet. So how do we think about those way, those things in ways that can actually be disruptive and not just be sort of sharing a meme that says boycott Amazon, but that takes into account that like the world of work we look at now is not the world of work that we looked at a hundred years ago. And so, you know, it's not not class struggle to you know, have it look different. And it's not not class struggle when the workers have a college degree. Speaking of Amazon, of course, right now there's a union election underway in one of those warehouses, a giant one in outside Birmingham, Alabama, which um, we don't know how it's gonna come out, but even President Biden has voiced his support for collective bargaining in this context. And that of course is a revival of um, Basically, it's very similar to factory work, the work that they do in those warehouses. It's yeah. even though it's, you know, high tech in some other ways, um, both in terms of, you know, the scanning that goes on in the factory. And um, so, so that does raise a, a challenge of how we um, synthesize or what's the synergy, if any, between the kind of organizing among those highly educated yeah. Um, sectors and old fashioned blue collar work, which is not dead. And um, here and there, we do see efforts um, to, you know, but in a very different idiom, if you will, then. So I'm, I wonder if you could discuss that, like, and it's sort of related to some of the questions in the Q&A, which I don't have time to read them all because we're, we're running out of time, yeah. but um, about, you know, the sort of future of the labor movement and how we can bridge these gaps between old and new worlds yeah. of work. Yeah, I was saying that I've been talking to some Amazon workers and who work in one of those roboticized warehouses and they sound just like I'm I'm reading Detroit I do mind dying over again, right? I'm just hearing the same stories of automation and who gets put 
in the place of dealing with these machines. And I was talking to um, a man who works in the warehouse outside of Minneapolis. And he's, an, he's a Somali immigrant who organizes with the Owood Center. And, you know, he's just saying like, this is not the system in Amazon is not designed for like human bodies. He's like, we have to compete with machines. We're running after machines all day and we're tracked so that if you, you know, take time away from packing to go to the bathroom, then the, the scanner that tracks you, you know, puts you basically in the hole and you have to work extra hard when you get back to get back up to the time on task that you're supposed to have. And, you know, it's just the same questions of the speed up, right? That the robots are not brought in to make the worker's job faster or better. They're brought in to make or make it faster, but not better. Um, and what ends up happening is workers are breaking their bodies to move faster. And Amazon warehouses have a higher rate of injury. And especially the, the warehouses that have more robots have more injuries than the average warehouse. Um, so, you know, the high techness of it is is not a new kind of high tech. It's the same old kind of high tech, high tech right? Like, I always love that, like, the Tesla factory is in the old Numi factory. Um, so, right, it's like the place where you sort of brought in that Japanese production, um, whatever. I'm losing words now, but, and now it's like where Tesla is. And when the workers at Tesla wanted a union, Elon Musk's like, we'll build a roller coaster. And they're like, union? union um because you can't actually take those tactics from the white collar work and just like plop them in and expect them to you know work on the blue collar workers in the same way but what's interesting is like the the white collar workers in a lot of these tech companies started organizing a lot of them around trump right so google was organizing against project maven they're organizing against surveillance they're organizing against um the tech they're making being used to deport people um, one of the, it's not surprising that one of the biggest um, hotbeds of the Google union is the ethical AI department, where they've been firing people who said your, your AI isn't ethical. Um, but, you know, the, the people who are thinking the most about how this tech is going to affect the real world are also the ones who are leading the turnaround and going like, hey, actually our working conditions also suck. Um, and actually also the way we can have the most power to affect what Project Maven does is by organizing as workers to say, we won't do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to say in a way like, mm, just go on strike. Um, so that the, the new and the old interact in that way in a really interesting way. And it is that thing again of those, you know, sort of would be white collar workers realizing that at the end of the day, you're still workers and Google is still making a ridiculous, ludicrous amount of money off of the work that you do. And you don't get a say in what that tech will be used for. So, you know, that the, the old uh, stories aren't dead. And I think it's, it's really useful and important to know, you know, that history. So you can hear those echoes, whether it's the communist teachers union being echoed in today's teachers unions or the, you know, the revolutionary black workers in, in Detroit's critique of automation being relevant to Amazon workers in 2021. But also we're gonna have to figure out some new things. So um, streaming on Twitch is, is a good start. Um, and how do we sort of understand what of the new tactics is, is useful and what of the new tactics is just sort of, you know, screaming into a void, that's gonna be the test. Well, um, we are going to have to wrap up in a moment, but I just want to ask one more question, which you can decline to answer if you want, because it's a little <laughs> more personal. So two people in the chat, including my friend Giovanna Fullen, who I guess has joined us all the way from Italy, um, are curious about your own personal experience and how that informed the book. Giovanna <laughs> writes, for example, I guess Sarah loves her job a lot. Did her personal experience help her in understanding the experiences of the workers she wrote about? Um, Maybe we could end with that one. Yeah. So before I became a journalist, as I mentioned, I finished grad school in 2009. Um, so I had several years between degree. Actually, I mean, my first job was cleaning up trash at an outdoor concert hall when I was 14. Uh, so between the time I was 14 and 27, I was working in food service and retail for all of that time, part-time and then full-time when I finished college and realized I still couldn't get a job because it was a recession. And I had an English degree, which was not terribly helpful. So a lot of my understanding of retail and food service work and emotional labor, when I got around to actually reading that book was like stuff that I recognized from the work life that I had had. 
And one of the things that was interesting to me about finally becoming a journalist and getting to that dream job is how much it still had in common with the same old stuff, including, by the way, that I had occasionally abusive bosses who, you know, I had a sexist, sexual harassing boss in journalism and I had a sexist, sexual harassing boss as a waitress. And both of them talked to me and treated me the same damn way. And, you know, it's, it's again, some of the stuff is new and some of it's just really, really old. And having fought the boss in the restaurant who told me he hired me because I wore seam stockings, um, prepared me in a way to try to fight the boss as a journalist to realize like this, this isn't just like, okay, because now I'm, I'm writing stories that I wanted to, now you're paying me to be a labor reporter, my dude. Um, and so, yeah, that's a long way of saying like, yes, absolutely. Um, when people ask me, you know, how I got to be a, you know, labor reporter who has Rosa Luxemburg framed behind her, I say punk rock and shitty jobs. Um, you know, the boss remains the best organizer and the fastest ticket to radicalization. <laughs> it's yeah. like working a lot of crappy jobs will teach you a lot about the world. All right, well, that's a good note to end on. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for participating in this webcast and um, podcast, sorry. And um, here's the book again, for those of you who haven't already seen it. Sarah said it came out a long time ago in January, <laughs> okay, January well, 2021. Months. This is a two journalistic, months. not a book writer's mindset, I might say, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone who joined and for Sarah taking the time to share her thoughts with us. And the book is available wherever books are sold. I particularly recommend Bookshop if you want to patronize independent bookstores. Um, and I guess we'll leave it there. So thanks everyone and um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.